Hi, so let me introduce you. Oh, so yeah. welcome, welcome to the Tetherless World. Welcome to the first, I think this is the first web talk of the fall 2018 season. We've had, we've had our pirates meetings. We've had idea talks, and I think this is the first web that we've done. Um, uh, just a couple logistical things. We are, uh, despite what people think I do on my laptop, we are live streaming this. Um, uh, we, and on the live stream, in case you were wondering, we multiplex uh, video and screen share. So uh, we try to jump between them. And, uh, and since we are going out live, just keep that in mind that you're, you're welcome to ask questions, but everything we go gets stored for uh, posterity on the intro web. Uh, so Alex Schwarzberg, thank you very much for being here. Alex is, is done and, and several different projects with Tetherless World, uh, the, the, the DARPA project with Peter Fox and Jonathan Samuel and all uh, and, uh, the, uh, the um, project with uh, the Gates Foundation, HBDKI. <laughs> um, and uh, and some of, for some of you, he's a classmate in the ontology engineering class. So without further ado, okay, Alex. Thank you, hype man John Erickson. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Alex Schwartzberg, and I am uh, talking about a project I've been working on for, I guess, almost a year in different iterations uh, called Codotype. Uh, so you can follow along online. The website is hosted at codotype.io, and you can just do whatever you want with it. Uh, all that being said, two caveats. The page load isn't fantastic. It's really not that optimized. So don't break me for slow page loads. I'm aware of it. And uh, if you try to break the tool, you could probably break it. So just be sensible. Um, but you'll just break it for yourself, not everybody else. Uh, so just quick instruction myself. I'm Al Schwartzberg, not Schwartzberg, like John Erickson nailed it. But I'm used to it. That happens. That's my whole life. Um, so I am an undergraduate at RPI. I'm graduating in December, Yay. barring any uh, academic catastrophes along the way. Uh, before coming back to RPI in 2016, I worked in industry for a couple of years. I was at Cisco for about two years in the uh, enterprise services lab. And then I was working at a uh, startup called Oracle Metrics for about a year. Uh, and then I came back to RPI to kind of wrap up my undergrad and down here. So uh, aside from doing software development at RPI, I'm still doing contracting work on the side. And I'm into a bunch of other stuff too, pick my brain about things I'd love to talk. Uh, but here today, I'm uh, going to talk about Codotype. So Codotype is an open source platform for code generation. And kind of specifically what that means, it uh, essentially enables you to auto-generate code bases for specific projects. Uh, so kind of the goals of it were to really be agnostic to what kind of code you're generating. It could generate front-end code, back-end code. It could generate code for static websites, kind of whatever you want. If it's built with text, you can generate it with Codotype. Um, it's language agnostic, which is another goal of the project. So generating code with prototype doesn't necessarily limit you to any one specific language or specific framework. Uh, if you're a Python developer and you want to use Python or you like React instead of Vue, you can use a lot of these different industry standard tools kind of uh, interchangeably with each other. And, uh, and the other goal of the project is really that everything is very configurable, that we don't tie you into any specific, very highly specific use cases. You can actually build generators to kind of do whatever you like. Um, so why would I go and build this thing? A lot of people build code generation tools before. Uh, so I do a lot of web application development, some mobile development, and applications are really complex. And they're kind of becoming increasingly complex. It's like, as the tools that we have available to us as developers continue to accommodate more interesting use cases, there's kind of an associated increase in complexity that we also have to contend with in the day-to-day -day whenever we want to actually build something. Uh, and starting a new project is really time consuming. You know, I'm sure, a lot of people in this room have developed software before, and if you have to start a new project, uh, I'm sure we've all done the thing where it's like we find a project on our computer that has the things we want, and we just copy that whole directory and paste it somewhere else and start making our edits there. Uh, so, you know, one of the goals of Codotype is to really kind of drive down the time it takes to go from idea to functional prototype. Uh, the other problem that this kind of addresses is that boilerplate apps, they're widely available. Boilerplate app, it's kind of like, the kitchen sink that you can get for everything. Uh, so you get a boilerplate app, and it gives you like user authentication and user role management and some permissions and authorization, kind of all the things you need. But the problem with boilerplate is that it usually gives you a lot of things you don't actually want. Uh, so you'll 
fork a good app that you like, and then you spend the next couple hours just deleting all the things you don't need. Uh, and then the other problem is that boilerplate apps don't really relate to your needs as a developer. You're trying to build something really specific. You have requirements, you have data, and you have associations and attributes. And boilerplate code doesn't really accommodate any of that. It's just kind of the starting point. Um, so Prototype basically works by making assumptions about what you're trying to do as a developer. Yeah, obligatory uh, XKCD cartoon. And assumptions are great. You know, a lot of people say you don't want to assume this makes an ass out of you and me. Um, but the truth is, assumptions are good if the right person is making them. Uh, mainly because details aren't important early on. If you're trying to get a new project off the ground, does it really matter if you're, what UI framework you're using, what front end framework, what back end framework, even which database? A lot of these details can just be irrelevant in the first couple hours of planning a new project. Um, and the goal is to really enable you to focus on building your logic and building your algorithm instead of just building the machinery that kind of makes it all work. Um, so kind of this is a quote that I think of all the time. It kind of sums up software development a little bit. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And that's kind of at least where modern web development's at today. You know, it's you might have an app with some really simple requirements, like oh, I want to send a call to the server that returns a greeting with my name. And it's like okay, well, you need a front end, and you need to know HTML, and probably some JavaScript, and some CSS, and you need to be familiar with different deployment strategies, and you have to build a server API, and you need to know about JSON, and you need to know about REST APIs, you need to know about probably Nginx and domain registration and DNS configuration. And it's like the list just goes on. It's like, I just want to build a simple thing. I just want to make an apple pie. Why do I have to invent the universe every time I want to do this? Uh, so this is really one thing that Codetype aims to uh, lead in. So I'm going to jump right into demo. And you can totally follow along on your computers if you like. It's at Codetype.io. Uh, so let's just jump in and we'll get started. So we are going to build an app together right now in this presentation. And we're going to deploy it to a production server. And then everybody in this room can actually just jump in and start using it. Uh, so, so does anybody have any homework thing to be done by tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the nice things about Codetype, it integrates kind of built-in tours for end users. So you don't have to actually necessarily know everything that's going on. The tool can kind of guide you through a lot of the nuances and a lot of the way the tool structures things. Um, so it gives you some example blueprints to start off with. Um, a blueprint, it's essentially a structure that encapsulates the metadata about your application. I have to say metadata so I can tie it back into what we do at Tetherless. Um, but basically, each blueprint encapsulates metadata, and you can have multiple different blueprints, blueprints for multiple different types of apps. Uh, so we can start with a clone of something, but maybe we want to build one of our own. Uh, does anybody have an idea for a simple app that they need to make? Like, I need to do shift management for a restaurant, or I have a dog kennel that needs a user portal. Pizza order. Pizza order. Awesome. Pizza ordering. Let's go. Good deal. So we created a new blueprint. And right out of the gate, it gives us a user model to work with. Because most apps are going to have a concept of an end user. You're going to need users to log in and authenticate and probably have some concept of user roles, like admins versus non-admins. Um, so that's kind of the starting model that we work with. But we can add other models on top of it. Um, so we're making a pizza ordering app. Let's say we have an order model. So we can create an order model. And it gives us just kind of a label to start with. Uh, so maybe we'll delete that. And we can add attributes to our order model. So how would you describe a pizza order? Be like, uh, had a, what's that? Date and time. Date and time. Uh, let's go with date time. Um, ordered at, maybe. And you see, actually, as I type this out, it's going to kind of auto-complete some little attributes for me. Um, so the idea is that it's going to kind of guide you through the process a little bit. Uh, maybe we'll say the date time is required, but we'll say date time for ordering ordered at shouldn't be unique, because two people conceivably order the same, a different order at the same time. Uh, sure. That's very important to me. And even more important to the people I buy pizzas for. We'll also set required on that. Um, so maybe Local we'll location. say price. No. Uh, <laughs> we'll just put price. Or alternatively, what we can do, we're going to have an order, and then probably an order is going to have a couple different items on it. So maybe we should add a model for a uh, an item. Yeah. Uh, we need a location. We will need that. So we'll add an item, and we'll add a price as well. 
and we'll say prices and, uh, and we have to have as well. contact phone number although that could be part of the order you resolve. oh yeah um so order let's say you want a location let's just put that as a string or deliver location and then we'll try to keep this pretty simple uh maybe we'll go back to our user model and add a phone number yeah and we'll make that require just so everybody kind of yeah it's actually you know what um so we've got an order and we've got multiple items and now we can add some associations between our different models so maybe we'll say something like a uh an item belongs to an order or better yet you can say multiple items belong to a single order mm -hmm. um, so maybe we'll just go and create that association uh, maybe we can go to our order model and say, well, a user can have many orders. That makes sense because we want return customers. Um, and uh, maybe this is sufficient for now. You can always keep building on top of it, but this is like a nice little starting point. So um, you're you're showing, you know, as you're going through and building the models, you're showing little snippets of JSON. Um, ah, yes. That's that's it. A little bit of the mechanics of how this is working, because it's it's that's it's it, it's internal way to represent what you're constructing, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and essentially, all these little these little boxes right here, they're really just previews of the kind of data structure that you're going to be kind of looking at. Um, so, for example, like if many items can belong to one user, an item is going to have a user ID attribute, um, versus if one item can reference many users, maybe it'd have a user IDs attribute, which is an array. Uh, so a couple different ways to cut it. Um, so, you know, I'm pretty pretty satisfied with what we got right now. Um, we can go and actually generate this right now. Um, so I can just go to this little build page. And then here I can pick which generators I want to use. And uh, you can pick multiple generators kind of every time you build your app. And really what each generator is, is uh, essentially kind of a standalone code base, but they can work together. Uh, right now, I only have two generators developed. I've got one front end written in Vue.js, which is industry standard front end framework for building uh, building browser applications, and then Express.js on the back end, uh, basically as the server to say where are these orders coming from, who are they going to, have they been paid, have they been picked up. Um, so we all say, well, we want to build a back end with Node Express. So it takes us to this page, and here it will actually show us the readme of the generator. So we have a little bit of an idea of what we're kind of getting into from a technical perspective. We can be a little familiar with what we're gonna be working with. Uh, but what's also nice about prototype is that each generator can expose its own configuration options. So you're not just limited to the kind of models, attributes, and associations you can define in the standard user interface, but individual generators can actually expose their own configuration to enable any end user to kind of more configure things with a higher degree of granular granularity than you kind of otherwise would be able to. Um, so if we look at these just little global options, uh, we just have two little options kind of thrown in. One is generate Docker Compose files. And I love Docker. I love Docker Compose. I use it in all my software projects generally from doing things that are web related. So I'll definitely leave that checked. Um, and then API doc headers. Uh, this is kind of another option. If you're not familiar with API doc, uh, it basically enables you to write these little snippets inside your code base and then auto generate documentation from that. Uh, really helpful tool because you don't have to maintain your documentation and your code. They're kind of maintained together and then you just auto-generate things, um, which is a recurring theme here. So like we'll say that configuration's all there, and uh, it will go out of front end because we want users to actually be able to interact with us. So we look at this and kind of similar thing. We have Vue and Vuex as our uh, front end generator. Read me, all of the instructions we need to actually run the thing. Uh, and then we have some different kind of options exposed here. So these are called model options. So these are actually configuration options that can be defined specifically for each model defined in your blueprint. Uh, so, for example, I think this generator just defines two different options. Basically, I can specify an icon that I might like for the app to be generated. So, if I'm looking at a user, I might use uh, FA user. And by the way, all of these icons come from an uh, icon library called Font Awesome. It's an awesome library that gives you lots of free fonts. It's really easy to work with, and they've got pretty much everything you can imagine under the sun. Uh, another tool that I use pretty much everywhere. And uh, if you haven't gotten it by now, I've really built this tool to scratch my own itch. So it's generally I'm building things my own way, eating my own dog food and then making a dog food factory to feed me more dog food, um, if you will. 
And then another option is basically you can pick a list style. So when we generate the front end, we can say, well, do we want a table for these, or do we want kind of cards for these individual ones? Uh, so maybe for items, we'll say, uh, we'll make a card list, why not? So we can collapse all these individual configuration options. And uh, now we're in good shape. So now we can just click our Generate button, and we'll actually get our code base uh, pretty momentarily. Oh, and if you are using the tool, it's going to put a pop-up. Uh, it's a bug I discovered this afternoon. So your pop-up pop -up locker might lock it, in which case, just disable that. I'll have that fixed in a later release. So it just downloaded the zip file with uh, all that code in it. I can actually open that up here. And uh, we can take a look through it. But basically, we have our Express backend right here. We have our Vue.js front end right here. All the kind of usual stuff. But I, let's actually kind of see what this can do. So let's uh, do a quick deploy. Just going to rename that. And I'm going to move that up to my little server right here. And let me just unzip that zip file. And CD pizza ordering. And I generated a Docker Compose file. So I'll just run Docker Compose up. And somewhere I just got to build the client. So we'll go into pizza ordering, UJS. I'll say yarn install and yarn. Uh, so those are going to take a couple seconds to get up and running. Does anybody have any questions while we uh, have a nice little wait for 30 seconds? So you can do it in any language except this is what you can do it in. Yes. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have a handful of other generators in progress, but the ones that are kind of ready for, uh, ready for showtime are the uh, Express.js backend and Vue.js frontend. But I have a uh, React generator in progress. I have a Python Flask generator in progress. Um, I've done things, I prototyped something using a Python native app, actually, which works reasonably well. I didn't have the time to polish it. But uh, as long as it's text-based, you can pretty much generate the code with it. Um, and the idea is that what Prototype gives you, it's a set of tools that really eliminate the friction from collecting this metadata and generating code with that metadata. Uh, so let's take a look, and I think that's running at... There was something out there on the client side. Yeah, something exploded. Order state, order store, order state. Oh, bummer. It's always a bummer when these things explode during demos. Um, that's the definition of demo. Yeah, no, it's true. It's not exploding. It's, we're not doing it right. Um, so let me compose RM. Bear with me. Uh, Unhandled promise rejections are depreciated. Promise rejections that are not handled are terminated. Let's try that again. I'm curious why that exploded. Uh, so let me just go with one of the. Uh, one of the demos. I'll duplicate a little kind of example blueprint, and I'll just go and kind of straight generate that. And that was file. And we'll give it a more shot. Sorry about that, folks. What are you running on your machine? Linux Mint. Pretty happy with it. I've been wanting to move to Arch, but I uh, don't want to do it during the semester because I'll mess it up. I love Linux Mint. Yeah, it's good. It's a little heavy, but definitely gets the job done. Which is ironic because this generator is Ubuntu is heavy and stupid. <laughs> well, yeah. And da, 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 da.
And it looks like the API server is up and running. And the client server should be up momentarily. There's only so much you can do to accelerate these things, so I do apologize. Uh, demo. Wow, really? Huh. Well, that's really upsetting. So, somebody moved cheese. Mm -hmm. Somebody must have moved my cheese. Huh. Hold on. It looks like a debugging is involved yet. Yeah, apparently. Huh. Yeah, debugging is fun with this because you're kind of gener you're writing code that generates the code that you then start debugging, so you can debug the code that generates the code you're debugging. It's uh, so meta. Yeah, it's very meta. Um, um, let me just try to do this real quick. Okay. So you're saying anything that's text based. But I'm wondering if there's more, more to the uh, the assumption. Like for example, if I wanted to, is is there? Wow, something's happening. Yeah, there we go. That looks like it's uh, doing the same. You know what I think it is? I think the demo server I set up. Huh. I'm must be mistaken, something is really not behaving, which is unusual because I tested this like less than an hour ago. It was definitely working, which is very embarrassing. Um, so I won't waste anybody else's time while I just step through that, which is super frustrating. Um, and I can instead tell you kind of about how it works. Uh, so, and then we'll kind of jump back and see if that gets working. Uh, so why make another code generator? There are a lot of code generation tools out there. This is Wikipedia's comprehensive list of code generation tools. There are a couple hundred options there. Uh, problem is, they're all really bad. They're all kind of terrible <laughs> in their own unique ways. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for this. Most of them are closed source, which is frustrating in the age when open source reigns king to have a tool that produces code uh, where the tool is closed source, and then the code produced with that tool might not have a license that necessarily enables you to do what you want to do. Uh, if you're not familiar with open source licensing, basically there are different licenses that say this code can be used for these specific purposes with these restrictions. Um, so some licenses produce code, or some licenses basically say this code can be used for non-commercial purposes, but if you want to use it commercially, you have to pay a licensing fee. Uh, some other things say you can use this license, but you can't close source anything if it's made with this license originally. Um, so there are a lot of different tools that are running things with lots of different licenses with varying levels of permiss permissiveness. Let's go with it. Uh, so everything Codetech builds is MIT licensed. So it's the most permissive, closed source it, you can use it to build a product for your company, you can keep it open source and give it to somebody else. Uh, the other thing that is really unfortunate about a lot of these other tools is that they lock you into specific tools and languages and frameworks. So there are a lot of code generation tools, but they only generate Java 7 code with Spring. It's like, how, who's, who does this really help? Um, so there are some kind of issues with that. And then the other problem is that a lot of these tools aren't cross-platform. So you have to download it on Windows and install it on Windows and only use it on Windows. And that's just not really where the software development ecosystem is at right now. Most people don't really want native apps to be installed. A lot of people are running on a lot of different operating systems. And not only that, but you know, a lot of people want to be able to programmatically generate code via, uh, via an API. And Codetype kind of enables you to <coughs> interface with that core library in a lot of different ways. So is making Codetype uh, cross-platform and open to various languages and frameworks, is that a lot of extra effort compared to like, what existing code generation schemes used? Or mm. did you just like discover a pretty low-hanging fruit by making it so general? Pretty low-hanging fruit, to be honest. There's no real interesting magic about what happens under the hood. Uh, it's, it's shockingly simple, actually, when you get into it. Um, but uh, yeah, really, it was low-hanging fruit. There aren't good cross-platform options. There aren't good code generators that build things with the tools that I want to use. Um, and a lot of this, like I said, is scratching my own itch. I want to accelerate my workflow on new projects. And uh, being able to generate code that I've written is pretty nice. 
Um, so, uh, so the goals of Codetype are to be cross-platform compatible. We want to be language and framework agnostic. Uh, we want to be friendly for beginners. We want to produce code that somebody who might not have a strong background in web development or software development could conceivably generate this code and poke through it a little bit and kind of make sense of it. And then uh, the other goal is to produce good, clean, functioning, sane code that looks like maybe a person actually wrote it uh, instead of just stuff that is produced via machine for mach other machines to uh, look at. So uh, how all of this kind of works underneath the hood, basically end users can find blueprints. We step through that process a little bit. Uh, those blueprints are basically can be paired with a number of different generators that are kind of all passed in the code type runtime in one shot. So that's what enables you to say, well, I want to use this front end and this back end and this documentation generator and give it all to me in one shot. Uh, the code type runtime enables that. And that's a separate library that is everything's open source. Uh, and then the last thing, once the code type runtime is finished producing all that code, it basically zips it up and sends back the end user, at which point you can iterate on that code a little bit more yourself or you can uh, take that and start modifying it manually. But uh, generally, I found that you know, I'll generate a code base and I want to kind of go back into the tool, modify my blueprints a little bit. I was building a textbook library a couple weeks ago when I added an ISBN number. Then I realized, well, there's ISB 10 and ISBN 13. I need to accommodate both. Uh, so it's nice. You get kind of catch scope issues really early on in, software, in your kind of software development lifecycle uh, instead of like three sprints in when you realize, oh, we need two attributes for ISBN numbers. Um, so the kind of process of generating code, and this kind of touches on what you asked, uh, basically we just have templates. We have an uncompiled template, which you see on the left. Uh, you see things like schema.classname and schema.attributes for each, where we just iterate over each attribute. And uh, basically we just output some information. So for example, this, this thing at line seven basically says, oh, if the attribute's data type is Boolean, then we put out a little bit of text that generates an attribute of type Boolean. Uh, and then what you see on the right is the actual code that's produced from this process. Uh, so for example, I think this is a checkout. So we had a start date, who is a string, that should have been date type. Uh, and we say, well, it is required, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so the process is really simple. It's just kind of taking basic templates and shoving your data into them. Uh, so how's all this built? Uh, I use Vue.js and UX on the front end and the browser UI. That's what enables you to kind of construct your blueprints and tie them together. Uh, I use Docker and Docker Compose basically just to deploy my production server, but you can just deploy it with anything. Uh, I'm using Learn.js, really new tool I just started using a couple of days ago. Uh, basically, it, it's fantastic. It resolves uh, basically a web of local dependencies in your computer. So I think Codotype is powered by Codotype. Got like 17 repositories, but of those, I think about five or six of them are really core to how things work. Um, so when I'm developing these things locally, maybe I make a change in one, but I have to make an associated change in three or four other places. And managing that by yourself can be a real headache. Uh, so Learna kind of gives you a framework to automatically resolve any dependency issues you might have locally while you're developing. Uh, aside from that, I use Bootstrap and SAS to make the UI look nice without putting in a whole lot of legwork on my end. And then lastly, Node.js is really what powers uh, everything under the hood. That being said, when you're writing generators, you really don't end up writing a lot of JavaScript. Uh, it's really more about writing templates and pushing data into them. There's very little JavaScript work that gets into it. Um, aside from that, the future prototype, really what I'd like to do is build more expressive generator creation tools into the platform. Um, so right now, you know, you can kind of construct these things by hand, but I'd like to get into the, really get to the tool to the point where you can have a generator generator, or you can say, here are the parameters of the generator I want to make, and it will generate code for your generator. Stop me from going too fast, because it, it is a little confusing and very convoluted. Um, aside from that, I'd really like to build out not just the creation tools, but the publishing tools. I'd like to really build this out to more of a platform where other people can make code generators and share them with other users, or even monetize them. Um, there are a lot of, you know, you look at something like WordPress, and you have free WordPress themes for everything, but there's obviously a significant market for people who are willing to pay a couple bucks for a premium WordPress theme that kind of gets them a little bit closer to where they want to be. Uh, aside from that, I'm kind of in the early phases of working on a command line interface, the CLI, basically enabling you to use the full scope of features and code type just from the command line, so you can bypass the UI entirely if you'd like to. Uh, and then adding user account systems, you can do things like store blueprints and generators and share them between different people. Um, aside from that, that's just kind of a quick thank you to all of you for showing up. Uh, obviously, thank you to RPI uh, before the ejector sheet seat 
throws me out of the room. Uh, Tetherless World Constellation, thank you. Another thank you to the Rensselaer Center for Open Source, uh, where I've spent a lot of time working on this project. Uh, so I'd like to thank Dr. John Erickson, uh, Dr. Debbie Guinness, and Dr. Peter Fox. And uh, A.D. Young, a friend of mine who works on yaks.io. If you're not familiar with it, yaks is the best way to schedule classes at RPI because doing it on SIS is just awful. It's just agonizing. So use yaks. Yaks is awesome. Uh, it is great. It's awful now. <laughs> I don't even know. That's right. You never had to uh, go through a, a huge board. room full of cards and pick out. Board. Yeah. And uh, starting that, just a thank you to Evan Yu and the Vue.js team, without whom this would not really be possible. Um, so, yeah, so let's any questions? Uh, um, so, I actually, so go back to, so how would you build a calculator? Oh, you wouldn't build a calculator. I'm, I'm asking, you can build anything or any, so how would you build? So, saying you build anything is kind of missing the point. Well, how would you build something with a, like a user interface, like a calculator app? How would you? How would you do that? You wouldn't. Okay. You wouldn't. Well, so what 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 would I be doing? So in the context of something, it, and uh, it's such a bummer. Actually, let me just take two minutes now and see if I can just get this. And just go through. So what I'm you know, I'm, I'm asking honestly, I want to I want a position that I'm you know um, not really being a devil's advocate, but I want to kind of clarify what are the kinds of apps, um, <coughs> the kind of applications that it's, it's appropriate for or not appropriate for. I will get that running locally and show you momentarily. Make sure everything's up and running. And of course, it works locally. Um, OK, so here is a Twitter clone that I generated. Um, this code is all auto-generated. I haven't touched any of it manually. It's just produced by the tool. Um, so for example, I can have uh, users that we created. Um, you can have things like tweets and favorites and follows. Very basic kind of Twitter clone. Um, so let me actually, I can go and log out. Um, so it comes kind of with batteries included. You have a login form. You have a registration form. Uh, I'll just log in as John Doe. Uh, so the kinds of apps that it generates to answer your question. So for example, let me go back here. So this is the uh, tweeter app. So here we have you know, a user, a tweet, a favorite, and a follow-up. Those are the kind of four models we have. And we have different attributes and associations between them. And this is the code base that's produced with it. Um, so basically, it gives us all the CRUD views and the CRUD API routes for all these models and some kind of little helpers to make sure those associations uh, are kind of linked up nicely at the API level and the front end level. So for example, like when I fetch my list of favorite tweets from the server, it will actually give me links to the user who favorited it and the tweet that was actually favorited. Um, or I can go to follows and I can say, well, John Doe is a follower of Jane Doe. Um, or I can go and add a new one. I can say, well, Jane Doe is a follower of John Doe. They follow each other. Um, so the idea isn't necessarily that it's going to generate this whole app for you, and as a developer, you are now obsolete and you will never have to do anything. The idea is that it's going to kind of tee you up with everything you actually need to build what you want without the burden of having to make a lot of decisions early on or having to wrestle with the endless tide of uh, the rising tide of complexity that we have to deal with as developers. Uh, basically, the idea is that it's going to give you all the machinery you need so you can actually focus on building a product, building your app, and building your algorithm that kind of sits around the machinery rather than spending a lot of time being busy just building machinery out. Um, so I can go and I know John's an active Twitter user. Um, I can say hello, TWC, and I'll say, you know, Jane Doe tweeted that. And, you know, you can see that the kind of user interface is a little primitive. It's not going to do things like give you a tweet form or I tweet and it knows that, oh, this is the user who tweeted it and we'll associate it with them. Uh, it kind of leaves it up to you to manually define those things. And if you would like to, uh, when you need to add in your own layer of customization, you can go in and kind of define some of those more specific requirements. Um, so for example, I think I was, I was building a, that textbook library, which is another good example. And you know, the app will give you everything you need to manage books and rentals and items and users and which users have which rentals, which rentals are active. But it doesn't give you the logic to say, well, 
a user can't rent a book that's already being rented. Well, the term is if an attribute is locked. So like I, I, I've been looking at like the textbook thing and so like email is a locked attribute. Yes, yeah, so it. basically it's only email and username on the user model, basically just to ensure that the apps are always produced with those two attributes. Um, it's always kind of assumed that you're going to be producing an app that has a user with a username attribute and email attribute. Uh, you can definitely change that in the code that generates. But uh, it's uh, there are more two kind of restrictions on what the tool will let you do. Um, hey, shoot. Uh, does it generate any action on access to the database or how it's all handled? <laughs> the calls are currently not authenticated. Um, it comes kind of with authentication middleware built in, so you could definitely make kind of routes through which you need to be authorized to use. And I think I probably will. Part of what I'm going to be working on soon is basically the API specification saying if you're producing an API that conforms to the code type API spec, it has to meet requirements A, B, and C. And I think one of those will be, you know, all the standard model creation stuff will need to be behind user authentication. And where the other one would be, do you have any plans for anything sort of outside of just setting up your, your database and database access? Um, I guess, I guess, for example, like, um, just like John was saying, like creating simple apps. Or like, what, what if I want an app and I want to be, to be able to access like a map on it and have a certain, uh, like maybe some, I think, that location attribute and I want to show those on a map. So specifically, right. so like a calendar, like add like a calendar or map widget that they automatically set up. Right. So that's, that's a good question. So in the core of the tool, no, those aren't really features that are going to be supported. The idea is that it's going to, handle uh, kind of all of the common case things. So you can add a model that has a geolocation attribute that conforms to a specific kind of format. Uh, and then it could generate a front end and you can say, oh, well, you know, I have the code and I can just add in the two lines of code I need to add my map widget. That could be it. The alternative, though, is that you could have a generator that exposes a level of configuration deep enough that would enable you to say, well, oh, for the user model, for this attribute, I want it to be displayed on a map. Um, but out of the box, the core of the tool really just collects the metadata and pushes it through the kind of prototype runtime with the generator. Um, and that's all by design. Basically, early on, my, my vision was essentially a tool that would let you say, well, I want to I want users to be able to log in with Facebook and Twitter and GitLab or GitHub or something and have these different UI libraries. Basically, what it came down to is you hit a point where the combinatorics of all these different configuration options just explode and get completely out of hand. Um, you end up with something like 20 factorial different combinations once you keep expanding your configuration. And not only that, but every time you add a new configuration option, all of your generators need to be updated to support it. Uh, so instead of taking that route that would you know, madness lies that way, uh, I basically elected to unload that level of configuration onto the individual generators and keep the core of the tool uh, very open but a little constrained. So, so to, to summarize that, so it's it's for kind of this coding scenario where there's a bunch of this stuff that you know, as you said, as you said up front, this this metadata is associated with the app, and you you need to apply it uh, in different situations in your code, apply it to different generators, and that is stuff that is a, uh, an activity that would be very, very error prone. It would, it would just, plus it's tedious as hell, even if you did it. And so the idea is to sort of configure that metadata and reuse it in different ways in that kind of a skeleton of your code, get that all cut in. And then you kind of come in with the dilithium crystal. <laughs> um, you know, like Charlie was saying, you know, that, that maybe I'm got a map code in this. So there's some kind of the, the unique stuff that you're going to put in there, but you've got kind of this framework that's been built around it and is also reproducible. You can hit the button again and change some things and have it kind of in the right place. That's right. kind of what, you're, what this is, is about, is cutting in all of that stuff that could cause lots of problems. Right, right, exactly. So, and, and one of the use cases that, that kind of describes, I have a friend who works at a uh, large catering company in Albany, and they've got, I think, something like 200 employees. And whenever an employee can't make it to a shift, they call up, and some unlucky person on the other end of the phone picks up, and they say, hey, I can't make it in this Saturday. And the person who picks up the phone has to go to the clipboard 
and call everybody on the list until somebody picks up and says, yeah, I can take the shift. And this is like kind of how all restaurants do it. It's a real problem with this catering company because they have so many people. So I was talking to him and he was like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we built an app where somebody leaves a shift and then we can text groups of five people and wait 15 minutes and see if one of them texts back. Otherwise, we can text another group of five employees and kind of collect those responses. So somebody could just get a text message and be like, oh, yeah, I could do Friday at 6, say yes, and you're kind of on the schedule. Uh, so we were talking about that use case and kind of what would be required for it. Um, and the business logic is really simple. It's like a user leaves a shift, an employee leaves a shift, dispatch emails or dispatch text messages until some condition is met, like somebody responding yes, and then stop dispatching. Um, the business logic is really simple. It's probably only like 50 or 60 lines of code maximum, you know, with testing. But it's everything else that you need to have a place. You know, it's needing to have a front end. It's needing to have a database. You need to have users and authentication, and kind of all the machinery that supports your fifty or sixty lines of code that actually does the thing you want to do. Um, so the goal was really to kind of automate the machinery so I could quickly scope out a project like that and uh, you know do something like ship it to a customer in a couple of days instead of a couple of weeks. Um, and you can see this here, for example, like. Every, every individual model will have its own view generated, and that view automatically populates any associations. So if I'm looking at, a, let me go and look at the John Doe user. Well, I can go to John Doe's page, and I can see all of John Doe's tweets, and I can see all of the tweets that he's favorited, and I can see all the people he's followed, and all the people who are following John Doe. And like, you know, you're building an app around this kind of data that's probably most of what you're going to need. You're going to need to go to the user page and see the person's tweets or see the person's followers, people who they're following. Um, so the idea is just to kind of give me all the things I need and maybe a little bit extra, and then I can kind of go from there and iterate. Any other questions? Sure. So just, uh, at the beginning, you showed that Wiki has more than 100 code generators, which are like not useful. So in the prototype, you have uh, other than like it's not user interface that you can get. Is there any other drawbacks? I beg your pardon. Any other drawbacks prototype other than other than it can't generate user interface. Like, oh right, right, right. Um, as opposed to all the other code generation tools that I've looked at, none of the other tools I've looked at can really do anything as contextually specific as like a calculator or a map kind of thing. Um, in terms of other drawbacks, no, because because you know I chronically look for reasons not to do things. Uh, if I'm working on a project, I'm going to keep researching all the ways you can poke holes in it and have somebody just be like, "This is a bad idea and it's a waste of time," uh, which is good because I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to tread over ground that somebody else is like. If somebody else had nailed this already and they just knocked it out of the park, I wouldn't have even gone near it. But uh, I keep searching for a tool to do this, and there's just nothing out there. There's nothing that actually suits my needs. Uh, there was something that came close, actually, called Prelang. Really, really interesting tool. Um, ah, what's the worst that'll happen? <laughs> yeah, really playing a fire here. Uh, so Prelang's tool I came across in 2014. Uh, it's conceptually really similar to Codotype. Uh, I can go and I have models, and I can add different models, and then here I can add different attributes and different associations. Uh, pretty similar. And then they also have some little things like features. So you can add you know, voting or user logins with some specific things like Facebook or username support. Um, so I think Prelang was the closest of anything I saw to kind of accomplish what I wanted Codotype to do. Uh, Prelang's got some serious, serious issues. Uh, it's entirely closed source. So I don't really know what's happening under the hood, and I can't really change a lot of it. Uh, it only produces Ruby on Rails applications. And nobody in 2018 is starting new projects with Ruby on Rails. It's just not where things are at right now. Uh, and then the other problem with Prelang, um, it's that it produces code that relies really heavily on internal libraries that are kind of specific to Prelang. So it's like you get, you get the code that's produced, and then it imports some magic controller somewhere from the Prelang lib and because you're, you know, I produce this code, I'm like, well, I want to edit it. I want to change it. I can build this thing because I want to customize stuff. And then you get in there and you realize that you can't customize any of it because they've abstracted everything away so much that you just have to not use the library and kind of write it all from scratch yourself anyway, which in my mind kind of defeated the purpose. Uh, and it also locks you into proprietary libraries that I don't have any control or 
Uh, so one of the other goals was really to produce code that kind of adheres to best practices and the industry standard tools as much as possible. Um, but no, no, I mean, I've been, I've been searching for more and more shortcomings. Uh, and the tool's obviously not perfect because I had two demos explode on me, uh, but it's, it's definitely getting there. Any other questions? Comments, concerns, qualms? In the, uh, you know, back to the, uh, the user interface kinds of things, you know, the building calculators or building map apps or something like that. It, it seems like um, there's an extensibility model where you've got the stuff that uh, code type does, but you could have um, UI type. <laughs> you can you can mm -hmm. have something that um, uh, sort of uh, along a similar vein creates code that um, uh, that allows user interface kind of construction and that provides a, a the handoff to a, a, a code generation framework. Right. You know, and I'm not saying Visual Basic. <laughs> um, but you know, visual, you know, or visual Studio, I mean, you know, but that sort of thing where you're creating an interface uh, from a, a, a you're, you're visually creating an interface, but there's code things that are happening, and but all it's doing is creating the hooks, and then right. you're re required to then pop in through that business logic or whatever call that's underneath Visual Basic <laughs> business logic. Um, but I, I think you see your point. My point is that there's, there's, it, it's doing a, a lot of stuff that could be discreetly coded if you wanted to, but you, you're, you're using UIs to, to construct this interface. That's and, then, and there's plenty of web clients that do right. that sort of thing too. Yeah, I mean, this is one I'm promoted with called View Egg. Uh, brilliant developer Alex Perez developed this tool. Basically, it's kind of a drag and drop editor that enables you to uh, produce. Oh, yeah. I think I just go and uh, da, 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 download the Vue.js code that's produced with this. Uh, shortcomings of this, it only produces code in one specific framework. And uh, you know, I've thought about a lot about kind of adding the UI kind of design tools into this. And this is open source under MIT. I could just gank all this code and throw it in a prototype and like call it a day. Uh, the problem is, is that when it comes to generating more and more front ends, there's just going to, I'm going to slam into that wall of ever increasing complexity. Um, so for example, if I wanted to, I worked on a, on a code kind of in progress generator that would build native Python apps with uh, Python 3.7 and the TK INT, T, T Tinker library, whatever it is. It's like the kind of de facto Python user library. Um, it's not really fun to work with and having a lot of control over the sizing of things and the positioning of things is a bit of a nightmare. Um, so instead of building a tool that kind of now has to accommodate all of that additional complexity, uh, I kind of opted towards just taking the more metadata route and then let individual generators specify how they want things to. Well, it seems on that, that JavaScript-based user interface stuff, there's a lot of crazy stuff happening you know, very quickly. Like there's a React.js and all that kind of stuff. Right. So there's a lot of activity there. Um, so it sounds like you're, you're not there. You're over here. And, 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 and it, things get stitched together. Right, right. And well, what's nice about it is that Codotype's not really susceptible to the kind of ongoing ebb and flow of what's popular in software development or web development specifically. Uh, another language comes out, another framework comes out, more tools become available, I can just bring them in to Codotype as another generator. Um, which is, you know, one of the things I set up from the start is really completely decoupling the actual process of generating code from the tools that are used to define that metadata. Um, so everything's very standalone, and uh, you can, uh, yeah, new tools come out, and you just adopt them into the ecosystem. All right. Any other questions? Tom wants to know if he can do his C code. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, I could. No Fortran interface in the C. <laughs> Get off my lawn. <laughs> you can uh, you can look at the documentation, and make your own generator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You can do it. It's but. flexible. It's flexible, Tom. One, one can do it. Now, now yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. So, are there any more questions? If not, let's, oh. let's thank Alex. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.